Greetings everyone. I hope this video finds you all happy and healthy. And seeing as the Lomachenko Rigondiao fight is fast approaching, let's continue to break it down and hopefully I could get to everything that I want to get to. Seeing as I had been asked how it is that the supposedly one-dimensional fighter in Guillermo Rigondeau was able to win two Olympic gold medals. I'm going to interpret that question to suit my agenda and then answer it. But before I get to all that, look, just because you say somebody's one-dimensional doesn't mean that they suck, right? George Foreman was... One dimensional. Didn't he have a gold medal and two and a half championships in the heavyweight division? Or two and a quarter, maybe? Two and a third? <laughs> Whatever it was. One of the biggest criticisms, most oft heard criticisms of Vladimir Klitschko was what? That he was one dimensional. Didn't he have an Olympic gold medal and one of the greatest runs in the history of the heavyweight division? Okay then. Now as far as how Guillermo Rigondeau won his Olympic gold medals, I cannot answer that question because I had not watched those fights and it's not likely that I will. But I presume he did it by punching people. But anyway, what I believe might be happening here, and this is me interpreting the question, is that one of my viewers, and I'm going to assume a Guillermo Rigondeau fan, is watching these videos and on some level he's agreeing, right? Because how can you not agree with the fact that a guy who's a basic 1-1-2 fighter with the one being, you know, not all that good and it's all about the two, you know, it's kind of hard to disagree that he is one-dimensional. He's very one-dimensional. So I think there's a recognition of this fact and while the same person is genuinely curious how a one-dimensional guy could be so good, right? Or how he wins his fights. Now, I'm not going to waste time talking about what happened 10 or 20 years ago during his amateur career. We're just going to talk about the here and the now, or the recent history, his professional career. So in this video, we're going to investigate a very important aspect to Guillermo Rigondeau's success as a professional boxer, how he wins his fights. Here he is fighting Rico Ramos, um, and you always have to be honest about the level of opposition, right? Rico Ramos was basically an Al Heyman hype job who got a couple of gifts on the way up, won the title on the lucky punch in a fight where he was getting schooled, and then after Rigondeau beat him, he got a couple more gifts. But still, even despite the fact that he got all these gifts, he really wasn't able to amount to anything. Just faded into obscurity, right? Maybe at one point, a promising prospect exposed by Shimoda, exposed by a couple of journeymen on his way up, uh, beat down by Rigondeau and, you know, kept on losing to journeyman and getting getting gift decisions right so just wasn't that good you have to be honest about the quality of opposition and if you hadn't watched any of these Rico Ramos fights that I allude to then your opinion really isn't all that valid but anyway as you can tell they're the same height and Ramos has a negligible one inch reach advantage which only really translates to half an inch if you per arm right if you really look at it uh very technically and pragmatically right anyway as you can tell ramos is moving into his right because he wants to lend the right hand right and you're going down throws that head-on collision, at least one of the head-on collision, swinging left hand without really setting it up, right? Because Ramos is circling into it, but because it's telegraphed 
and so wide and predictable, Ramos is able to duck under it, right? But Rigondeau is the aggressor, and he starts throwing bombs, right? But check this out. Rigondeau has the tendency when he throws that left-hand bomb to literally lunge, right? He lunges in so deeply sometimes that that left knee of his will touch the canvas, actually. And when he gets in this position, he's very vulnerable because, well, he's out of position. He cannot throw any punches from here, not any effective punches anyway. And he has to recover, get back in his boxing stance before he can do anything effective. Moreover, his right hand is down. Obviously, obviously he's throwing the left, so he's exposed from both sides, right? However, due to his incredible athleticism, at the age of 31, right, he pops right back up and he blocks that punch. Look at it again. Gets out of position but is able to partially block that punch and pop back up and continue, right? So, you know, fundamentally, Rigondeau makes a lot of mistakes or does a lot of things quote-unquote wrong, but his athleticism allows him to escape with making these mistakes, right? At least against you know, an overrated hype job like Rico Ramos. And that's not hate, that's just being honest. Look at Ramos's um jab, right? It's he's very unsure of himself. There's no there's no probing. There's no attempt to look look at that jab. Very insecure, right? There's no attempt to control your opponent with the lead hand. He's not checking anything really. Throwing very weak punches. He's he's mentally affected. Now he's still moving into his right because, well, lo and behold, he wants to lend the right hand, right? But look at the punch. Look at the quality of this punch. Very weak, very insecure, which is probably why he gets countered, right? If if he were to throw that punch with conviction, he would at the very least get Rigondeau out of position or put him on defense where that counter punch wouldn't have come right back at him, right? Enrico Ramos stated that he was very nervous going into this fight and the commentators noticed that he's very tense and apprehensive and, well, they don't say it like that, but he's scared. But you see this lunging by Enrico Diao and so does, and how he exposes himself, makes himself vulnerable and so does Enrico Ramos, right? He tries to counter, but it's not quite there because Rigon Diao's extreme athleticism allows him to escape, right? Ramos is still very insecure, but, you know, he still wants to work the right hand because that's what you're supposed to do. That's the stereotypical... Um, that's the cliche, basically, right? You have to use your right hand against against the southpaw, as if the southpaw didn't have a left hand. <laughs> but, no, it makes sense. You know, it's one of the punches. Both of them are lined up for each other's right hand for long sh or rear hand for long stretches of of the confrontation, right? You keep seeing the same thing over and over from Rigondeau, right? Lunging in dropping his hands, chin up in the air, exposing himself, and Ramos wants to counter, but he's not able to. But he sees the opening, right? The opening's not hard to see. It's just the athleticism of Rigondeau that saves him, right? Looked like maybe a bit of a low blow. I'm not sure. Yeah, it looked like a low blow. Definitely. Looks like Cortes maybe warns him. So Rigondeau throws three big left hands and Rico Ramos goes down. Now, you'll see this on, on the replay better, but that punch grazes Ramos. It doesn't land flush. Their feet tangle and Ramos goes back, loses his balance after their feet tangle. This punch hits the guard, and it gets through the guard a little bit, but it hits the guard first and doesn't land flush. 
And then Ramos ducks the very predictable left hand from Rigondeau because that's essentially the only punch he throws, right? And then Rigondeau kind of nudges him to the canvas and Rico Ramos is happy to oblige. I'm not saying he isn't necessarily buzzed a little bit. I don't think he is. I think he's faking it because as you'll see in the replay, Rigondeau didn't land anything flush. But he, you know, I think Rigondeau notices that Ramos is, you know, mentally affected and he just jumps him, right? With reckless abandon. When people talk about Rakum Sakum, this is exactly Rakum Sakum right here. We're going to slow it down. Look at how Rigondeau just, you know, this is all he does, right? Left hand bombs, trying to punch through the guy. Exposes himself, takes a right hand, right? Goes flying back. But Rigondeau is the confident one, and Ramos has no confidence, so there's no power on his punches. You see, the counters are there, but Rico Ramos isn't really committing to anything. He's afraid, and Rigondeau sees it and takes advantage of it, right? He got a guy that's basically scared and nervous and apprehensive and all that other good stuff, and he does what every good boxer should do. Okay, look at this. See how their feet tangle? Looks like Rigondeau actually takes a jab. I'm going to slow it down even more. So you're going to see Rigondeau do his trademark lunge and expose himself. And it looks like Ramos will meet him with a jab, but not a very stiff one, right? You see? He could have stopped him there had he had a good stiff jab. So he trips up even though he doesn't land. That gets through the guard a little bit. It sends him back. And that doesn't land. And Rigondeau just kind of helps him to the canvas. But to me, you know, the commentators right now are debating whether or not that was a knockdown. Um, I think so, but it was more of Ramos kind of taking a knee and, and just kind of going to the canvas and Rigondeau helping him out. A punch did land, so I thought it was a knockdown. Even though I don't think... He was hurt all that much. So, I find it interesting that, well, never mind. Let's continue. So, Rico Ramos is now going to start moving to his left more, right? Because Rigondeau took away that from him and mostly just his confidence and Ramos is going to work his left hand now more than more than before right so his initial plan was to work the right hand go to his right and work the right hand but he wasn't very confident about it while doing it and then Gundiao noticed and took whatever little confidence he had away from him making him adjust and try something different but it's not it's not really what Rico Ramos wanted to do initially right so he's less he's less secure he's being made to adjust and change his game plan now he's going back into his right because he really wants to land the right hand he seems to believe that that's the best thing to do in this case and he could be right but he lands a jab on Rigondeau right and he's able to avoid the counter See, he here, even though he didn't really commit to the jab all that much, he landed flush and Rigondeau, threw Rigondeau off balance a little bit, which allowed him enough time, displaced Rigondeau, and it gave Rico Ramos enough time to get out of there, right? Rigondeau wasn't able to counter him because Ramos, even though it wasn't a very stiff jab, it was better than what he did previously when he did get counter, right? There he jumps in with the right hand. Kind of looks like maybe he's headbutting at the same time. But, you know, this is the thing about closing the distance on Rigondeau, right? You get inside and he cannot hit you with the left hand because the left hand, well, he winds it up and it's, and it's looping, right? And he's not an inside fighter. So he misses the left hand because it's not a straight punch at all. Right? So closing the distance on Rigondeau intelligently is actually what you should do.
to beat them. But, you know, there's there's this mythology that Guillermo Rigondiao, you know, or this belief that comes from a mythology, this belief that he's going to, you know, catch Lomachenko on the way in and knock him out or hurt him or just keep catching him and win the fight like that, right? Well, that could happen, but show me one fight against a C or B level opponent where it did happen, right? In Guillermo Rigondiao's prime. It could, theoretically, it could happen, but show me where you're getting this idea from. Rico Ramos isn't getting knocked out closing the distance, is he? Is he? But, you know, Rigondeau isn't very secure himself either. He's actually a very insecure fighter, very cautious fighter. He's got a deer in the headlights in front of him, and he's not taking advantage of it, right? Except here and there. There, Ramos, he didn't get the outside angle. Look at his feet. He steps on Rigondeau's foot, so that right hand was never going to land. But, you know, Rigondeau's not really... Um, Reacting with his footwork, Rico Ramos is just shook and apprehensive and a little bit scared where he he doesn't do the right thing with his feet, right? Instead of letting his feet get him in position, getting position on Rigondeau, taking the outside angle and landing the right hand, he just kind of does both simultaneously, but neither at all, right? He's jittery. He's scared. He's not, he's not thinking clearly. He's, you know, he's scared of Rigondeau's quickness, athleticism, and punching power. That left hand got him shook. But, obviously, and admittedly, he was also afraid prior to the fight. But, you know, again, Rigondeau has a deer in the headlights in front of him. And he's not really doing much himself either. And, you know, the next three rounds are basically the same. If they throw six serious punches each per round, you know, that's a miracle. But here you see Rico Ramos getting into the fight a little bit because Rigondeau isn't really, is allowing him to. And that could be because Rigondeau is really more comfortable as a counter puncher and doesn't want to lead, right? But... It has to be said that he's not pressing his, he's not pushing his advantage. He's not taking advantage of the fact that he has Rico Ramos scared and he lets him get into the fight a little bit. So here Ramos takes the outside angle. He, he kind of blinds him, sets it up with the jab, gets his left foot on the outside of Rigondeau's lead foot and lands a little bit of a slapping right hand right on the inside and then ties up. So the openings are there. You can hit Rigondeau. You just have to be confident. And you got to go for it, basically. You got to take chances. And you have to close the distance. And he does it again in another instance. It looks like um, Cortes warns him for headbutting, right? Or, or tells them to watch their head. Uh, iffy. Anyway, I'm not going to... We're not going to watch really the rest of these rounds except for the last one because there's really not much to break down here. But look at this right hand from Ramos again, right? Very insecure. Doesn't, doesn't get foot position. Look at it again. He doesn't get foot position. Just steps on Rigondeau's foot and gets countered with a bunch of body shots. You know, he's not, he's not doing the right thing. He needs to get closer to Rigondeau. He needs to take the outside angle and move away from the left hand. But anyway, you know, there he kind of committed to, to the right hand a little bit. And Rigondeau wasn't able to counter him, right? He tried, but I don't think he landed anything. So I'm not going to torture you guys. That would be cruel to show you all, all this stuff. Here, Rico Ramos lands a double right hand, right? 
or he lands the second one. I'm not sure where it lands, maybe on the chest or clavicle, but you hear the impact of that second punch. Right? He gets p foot position on Rigondiao and doubles up on the right hand. So, you know, he didn't, he didn't get knocked out on the way in, did he? Right? He didn't really take any counters either because that was a powerful right hand. He committed to it and closed the distance, getting foot position on, on Rigon Diao. And when he does that, he actually has success. When he actually takes chances, he has good success and he's not getting hurt or knocked out, closing the distance. It, it didn't happen like that in this fight, right? Anyway... There's not a lot to break down from a technical standpoint. There's a couple of instances where Ramos begins to use his head and headbutt, and he gets warned for it. And it's significant because of what's about to happen. Okay, here we go. So here you're going to see Ramos jumping with his head, right? Blatantly headbutting Rigondeau. Look at it. Come on. Here we go. He faints him. I think he's going to faint again. Right? And then he's going to jump in with his head. Bam. So you could clearly tell that Ramos's head is way below Rigon Diaz. And if they're clashing, it's it looks like maybe the top of... Ramos's head is hitting Rigondeau on the chin, maybe on the cheek, right? Rigondeau's head is up, Ramos's head is down, is what I'm saying. But now, look at how Ramos behaves, right? He jumped in with his head and headbutted Rigondeau, but he's acting like he got headbutted and is hurt, right? He's faking. He doesn't want to be in there. Look at him wincing, acting like as if he got hit on the brow ridge, right? When that, that's impossible. And if he did, he was getting hit there by Rigondeau's chin, which wouldn't hurt that much anyway. But, you know, he's wincing. He just doesn't want to be there, just like in the first round. And Rigondeau sees that, and he just goes haywire because he sees he has a guy that doesn't want to be in there. And what does he do, right? What does Rigondeau do? He jumps in with just consecutive left hands, right? That he doesn't even send, set up. He's just looking to punch through him, right? Rock him, sock him. Opens himself up, takes a counter. Just, is just punching his arms, right? Maybe he gets through there a little bit, then gets through, and then hits him to the gut. And Rico Ramos takes a dive. He didn't want to be in there. He had no confidence whatsoever. Um, I'm not saying the punch didn't hurt, but it wasn't one of those monster lunging left hands by Rigondeau, right? It wasn't one of those punches. It was a good punch. It was a powerful punch, but Ramos just took a dive. You know, but that's just what happens when you don't groom your fighters, which is an Al Heyman pattern, for the big occasion. They go into the fight nervous, you know. They never really learn that much on the way up because fights that should have been learning experiences where they should have gone to the drawing board were gifts, right? They got gift decisions. But look at Rigon Diao. He's just, everything's telegraphed, right? He's wide open for that counter. But Ramos just got no, no confidence, right? Rigon Diao misses, opens himself up. The counter's right there. Maybe he grazes him, I'm not sure. But Rigon Diao is just wide open, rock him, sock him style, right? And he can, he can afford to do that because Ramos is a deer in the headlights. You know what I mean? See, it wasn't, it wasn't that typical powerful left hand from Rigon Diao, right? Not quite an arm punch, but it wasn't all that powerful either. Hard shot, don't get me wrong, good shot. And kind of pushes him to the ground, you know. Ramos just takes a dive. His eyes are closed. He's rolling around the canvas. Man, if your midsection hurts, you don't want to be moving around. You want to be still. It 
whatever. But how did Egon Diaz win this fight, right? Was it with superb boxing skills? Don't get me wrong. There's ability there. There's a lot of athleticism. And he's got the left-hand technique, even though it's technically incorrect, right? Because of his supreme athleticism, it works for him and it's a good tool. But how did he win the fight? Just basically the the biggest determining factor was Guillermo Rigondeau's confidence. And maybe more importantly, because Rigondeau isn't a very confident fighter, was Rico Ramos's lack of confidence. So let's briefly also look at Guillermo Rigondeau's fight against a man of many names. But at the time he was called... Sod Kakiet Jim, at least that was one of his names, I don't know. So we're going to call him that. Now, this guy is a better fighter than Rico Ramos. Maybe not on paper, but a better fighter. But he's also 37 years old, which is old, especially at the low divisions, lower divisions. And he's at the end of his career, right? So while he may not, he's no longer in his prime physically, he's a veteran, right? And And he's been there. He's got, I don't know, something, 60-something fights probably. He's been there, done that. He has experience. And the thing that comes with experience, something that Rico Ramos lacked, is confidence, right? So now you have a confident fighter, you'll see, which you'll see promptly, going in there against Rigondeau. And a fellow Southpaw, which, you know, since we're talking about Lomachenko here, isn't interesting, is, is a more apt uh, comparison, right? So, right away you see that he, he's an aware guy and defensively responsible guy, right? He sees Rigondeau's punches and, and he swats them down or blocks them or rolls them even though he gets grazed there, right? He's seeing everything. Changing levels. He's not really, he's not probing with, with his lead hand. It's, it's basic boxing one-on-one, you know, but He's not trying to control his opponent with the left hand. They're just boxing. And again, you have two southpaws and the jabs are prominent, right? See that body punch from Rigondeau, that jab to the body. He sees it, slaps it down, blocks that. You know, he's he's not going to be easy to hit. And then he jumps in with the left hand, which even though it grazes, it doesn't land... You know, he sees the opening, right? Because Rigondeau is open for the left hand. What what he does is he rolls the punch. It gets him there a little bit, you know. If if that's a sharp puncher, a hard puncher, a fast puncher, and he hits him behind the ear there, that might do damage. But Rigondeau also sees the punches and, and mitigates the effect of the punch. You know, takes a jab to the body and... Bl- and sawed blocks what Rigondeau is coming with, right? He lands a he lands a jab upstairs. Right? Jab to the body, blocks that even though it gets through a little bit, jabs him upstairs. You know, he's in there. It's very competitive so far and he's again aware and, and he's got some skill. He's not scared, right? He's holding the center of the ring, and they're boxing. Neither guy is scared. But Saad isn't a deer in the headlights like like Ramos, which also allows him to, you know, see the punches and, and be able to utilize his boxing brain. His, his mental ability, capacity, isn't stifled by fear, right? Like Rico Ramos. Lends a right hand on Rigondeau. And he's slow, right? He's slow. The punches are looping. A left hand rather, right? But the opening is there. It's a clubbing shot, but he lands it, right? Rigondeau is open for that for that punch. Right? So this looks like a fight where Rigondeau is gonna have to work. Right? He he's gonna have to he's gonna be asked some questions, just like in the Drian Francisco fight. And look. Let's see what happened here. We're going to slow it down. A couple of things I want you to notice. Um, Sod Kakiet Jim has Rigondeau timed, right? 
it's the first round and he already has them timed. He has them figured out, at least in, in so far as the counter left hand and the left hand in general, right? He sees Rigondeau. Why does he have them timed? Because Rigondeau does the usual, right? Jab, jab, left hand. Jab, jab, step inside with the left hand or get closer, step into mid-range with the left hand, right? So he times it. He pulls and counters Rigondeau and lands. But Rigondeau headbutts him at the same time. Now, since we've been watching Rigondeau for a while now, we know that when he jabs, the left hand follows, right? When he, when he jabs and takes a step inside or into mid-range, the left hand always follows, right? I'm going to try to pause it at the right moment. There goes the jab, and he's getting closer while throwing the jab, right? So in this instance, when Rigondiao gets close to you, just about 100% of the time, he will wind up the left hand, right? He will pull it back and try to throw, throw a bomb. But none of that happens, right? What happens instead? He doesn't pull the left hand back because he's not throwing the left hand. He's throwing the headbutt. Boom. Right? He hits him with his head as Saad is hitting him in the face. Right? So, something about Saad Kaki Jim, maybe it was his confidence, maybe it was his boxing skill, probably both. The fact that he was getting Rigondeau timed and he landed two left hands and a third one right now, you know, had Rigondeau insecure. Because his opponent was very sure of himself, Rigondeau wasn't as secure himself. So he fouled him. He blatantly headbutted him. And now, now he pretends to be a sportsman, right? He touches gloves, but he uses that as an opportunity to set up the left hand again, right? Boom. Lands a nice left hand and knocks him down. Quick stoppage in my in my opinion. He should have been given five minutes to recover after that vicious headbutt. But it is what it is. Look, Guillermo Rigondeau. Well, well, we'll just move on. I'll I'll make my point later. But this was very unsportsmanlike behavior from Guillermo Rigondeau, and not a credible victory. It just wasn't. That's that's not. That's an objective statement, right? That's not hating. That's not not hugging. That's just being objective, okay? And look at look at his opponent. He's pissed off because he knows he he got done wrong. They treated him like shit. Look at these guys trying to disguise the fact that what we just saw was bullshit. Another disappointing Guillermo Rigondeau performance, right? He had a guy in there that was confident and it looked like he was gonna give him a good fight, so he took him out with his head. And unsportsmanlike conduct. It is what it is. And those are facts. Those are not opinions. Those are facts. Now, um, let's watch just the first round of the Guillermo Rigondiao Hisashi Amagasa. And let's again talk about the opponent. Hisashi Amagasa, you know, all you ever heard is as far as how they compared physically, right, was how he was so much bigger than Rigondeau, which is what made this win so impressive, right? But no one ever talks about how Hisashi Amagasa never fought at 122 pounds. By, by this time, he had like a 10-year-long career or so, and not once did he fight at 122. He was a featherweight his entire career, and for the first time in his entire career, he fought at 122 in the biggest fight of his career. So, and I also heard Guillermo Rigondeau in an interview say that Hisashi Amagasa was 160 pounds in that ring. Now, that's incredible, but I'm not willing to call Guillermo Rigondeau a liar just based off of that, but that's just incredible to me. If you're telling me that this guy weighed in at 122 and then hydrated back up 
38 pounds, what you're telling me is that he had a life-threatening weight cut before the fight, okay? And even if Rigan Diao is embellishing, i.e. lying, and Hisashi Yamagasa lying to us, you know, and, and exaggerating by 10 pounds, right? He's, if, if Hisashi Yamagasa had to lose, quote-unquote, only 28 pounds, or he hydrated back up 28, meaning he lost a lot more than that also, that was also a life-threatening weight cut and an incredible weight cut and definitely one that will drain you, deplete you as a fighter. I don't tend to like to use the word drain because people exaggerate. When a fighter has to come down one pound in weight, you know, they call it draining. When it, That's just nonsense, right? This guy had to come down a whole division and suffered a very, very dangerous, if not life-threatening, weight cut, right? So he wasn't at his best by any stretch of imagination. Okay, so that has, if you're going to sit there and point out how big he was, you also, it's biased for you not to talk about, it's unfair not to talk about the fact that he was a depleted fighter, which he was. But, once again, you see a guy that's not scared of Rigondeau, right? Closes the distance, closed the distance like nothing, right? Did he get knocked out on the way in? No, he didn't even get hit. Jumps, okay, fine, he surprised him, but he jumps on Rigon Diao and gets off a bunch of punches. Little pity patter stuff for the most part, but he lands something. Rigon Diao tries to counter, but look, look at this counter, how, how slow and insecure he is, right? Rigon Diao. And, and just, what the hell was that, right? Nothing. I don't know, maybe he was hurt. <laughs> and now, Amagasa changes it up. Now he's going to box, right? He's going to move. Or maybe he's going to ambush fight. I don't know. But now he reestablishes distance and he's dictating, right? Now it looks like he's going to want to step inside with the right hand. But look, he's checking Rigondiao's jab, right? He's... There, we got the battle of the lead hands. He's, he's asking questions of Rigon Diao. He's giving him a little wrinkle he has to worry about, right? So he's showing him two distinct, so far, game plans. Jump him and then box him from outside. Or maybe just ambush fight him, period, right? But he's showing, he's showing complexity in his game plan. He's not a basic fighter, right? Even though he's drained, even though he's gangly, even though he's slow, even though he's not the best boxer there, he's a thinking, confident fighter, right? So what does Rigon Diao do? He lands a low blow and apologizes, right? Blatant low blow. Right? Apologizes, acknowledges the low blow, right? So now Hisashi is, is boxing, right? Moving to his left and landing the jab. Maybe he didn't land, but he's working the jab, right? He's boxing, throwing the right hand, checking things out. So you see two different game plans, box and fight. Very intelligent game plan. Show Rigon Diao different things. And look at Rigon Diao's left hand. It's nice, but he's out of range. It's not, you know, it's not really there. Hisashi is aware and defensively responsible. You know, he's slapping down Rigon Diao's jab, right? He's trying to take away that scope, as we've been talking about. And what does Rigon Diao do? What does he do? Well, he low blows him again, right? Look at it again. Boom, low blow. Um, Guillermo Rigondeau was insecure. Look how easily Amagasa closed the distance, right? He just stepped inside with his hands up. Did he get knocked out or even caught with anything on the way in? Did Rigondeau even throw anything on the way in? Why is that? Well, it's because he's very insecure, in my opinion. He's just unsure of himself, right? So he saw she closes the distance and... Throws a bunch of punches, mostly on the guard, but it looks like he gets through a little bit because Rigon Diao doesn't have the tightest of guards. And, you know, he tends to hold his uh, left hand low. And you see, after Amagasa punches 
Rigondeaux's forearms a little bit, he has to shake them out, right? It's affecting him. And I'm not saying he necessarily scored in that instance, unless he did land. But it's, it's effective. It has Rigondeaux shaking his arms, right? Dropping his guard. He's affected. And now he's actually moving again, showing him a different game plan. Going to the left, going to the right. Now he's boxing him, right? Rigondeaux lands another low blow. No, that one, that one landed on the body, looks like. And he saw she swatted it down. It looked like a low blow because of that, but it, it wasn't. But two low blows so far, right? He saw she's boxing, dictating. Boom. Blatant low blow, right? He even acknowledges right, it right away. Oh, my goodness. Look how low Rigon Diao's head is. Rigon Diao's head is basically at the belt line. So where is his punch, do you think? You know what I mean? Blatant, disgusting low blow. Apologizes, acknowledges it. So it's a third one so far. Three low blows so far, right? Barely a warning. Hisashi's got, he's long, he's tall, you know, he's difficult. He's moving away. Re-establishing distance. There's another low blow from Rigon Diao. Right? No warning from the referee. There Rigon Diao steps in and punches, punches his guard, right? This is what he does a lot. He tries to punch through your guard. But he's unsuccessful there. There he gets him with a little left hand to the body, right? Very similar to the punch that he landed on Rico Ramos, but, well, even this bean pole of a guy, right, that's drained, he's unaffected by it, right? Because he's confident. He's there to win. It looks like Rigon Diao maybe lands. Uh, it's partially blocked, but he moves the glove out the way and lands the left hand and follows up with the right, but also takes a right. And Hisashi is countering, right? These punches aren't wrecking him. They're not stopping him in his tracks. He's able to take a punch and counter, right? He's able to fight Rigon Diao. And he jumps on Rigon Diao, right? Misses everything. Rigon Diao is able to get out of there, but he's offensive and he's dangerous. He closes the distance, takes away that scope, right? Almost lands the right hand. And it looks like Rigon Diao gets him a little bit on the, on the chest, maybe, clavicle area. But very competitive, very close so far, right? Amagas is doing what he wants to do. Anyway, we're not going to watch any more of this fight. But look, Guillermo Rigondiao knocked out Kokiet Jim with his head, essentially. He low blowed a drained fighter in Amagasa all night. Go watch this fight. It was just a low blow after low blow after low. Vicious, intentional low blows, right? He. We all know what he did to Moises Flores, how he broke the rules to to get the guy get the guy out of there. So, you know, Guillermo Rigondiao has no respect for the rules of boxing. That's an objective truth, you understand? He has no respect for his opponents. That is not an opinion, that's an objective truth. So I don't understand why some of these Rigondiao Clapping seals are so upset when fans of boxing or boxing fans don't respect Rigon Diao. I don't know who some of you guys take us for, but respect is earned and not given. You understand? You don't get respect because you're born and you for them sure don't get respect because you're born a certain color or nationality. Respect is earned, not given. And if you're not going to respect the sport of boxing and your opponents, 
I would be a sucker to respect you. But you go on right ahead. You be whatever you want to be. Just don't expect me to be a sucker like some of you guys. And shout out to all the real boxing fans. I'm not talking to you. But anyway, let's close this out by looking at my man's Artorius Boxing's highlight video of Salido's low blows in the Lomachenko fight. Now, Solaris also made a video like this, a much longer video with many, many more low blows. These are just some of the most blatant, most, most disgusting ones, right? So, basically what I'm getting at here, and a lot of you are already getting this, no doubt, is that the way Guillermo Rigondia, one of the ways he can win, and the most likely way he wins this fight against Lomachenko, is if he fights him the way Salido fought him, right? And because he's shown us that he has no problems fighting like that in many fights, Guillermo Rigondiao that is, you almost have to expect Guillermo Rigondiao, who's going to be in there with a guy that's bigger than him, a guy that's very good, we have to assume he's going to go into the fight very confident, and we have to assume that he's going to have success against Rigondeau because if Sot Kokit, Jim, Moises Flores, Amagasa, you know, have had success, Drian Francisco, who beat him and got robbed, if they can have success, you have to assume Lomachenko is going to have success. And once Lomachenko starts having success and he shows confidence, you almost have to expect Rigondeau to start breaking the rules because that is just what he does. And since we're not insane... We're going to learn from the past, looking into the future, right? So, if you're Vasily Lomachenko, it's a valid concern, right? Because Guillermo Rigondeau isn't this master boxer that a lot of people say he is. He doesn't have all this amazing technical boxing skill. He's got some, right? He's very athletic with his athleticism now that he's 37, but really more like 42, and he's fighting a bigger guy who's more athletic and younger, you know, that's going to be nullified, the athleticism. Um, you know, you almost have to assume, you're starting to see how, you know, if he's in there with a guy that's, let's just say he's just as good as far as boxing skill goes, but he's much better because Rigondeau, you know, he doesn't press his opponents when he, when he has a deer in the headlights and he's very insecure, right? So Lomachenko is going to be, again, secure. He's technically better. He's the more athletic guy, just as fast, but faster in combination. You know, he has all these advantages that are going to nullify a lot of the ways in which Guillermo Rigondeau wins his fights, right? And that's going to leave Guillermo Rigondeau, if he truly wants to win this fight, with no choice but to resort to that which has always worked for him when his opponents have matched him in, in you know, boxing skill or confidence or, or maybe even overmatched him in some of the areas like size, reach, height. Um, and because this, the, you, you definitely have to expect Lomachenko to overmatch Rigondeau in a lot of areas, some areas, because of the pattern that we've seen with Rigondeau when that happens, you have to expect him to fight dirty, because that's just what he does, right? That's, that's just an objective analysis taken, honestly taken into consideration uh, history and, and learning from history in order to try to predict the future, right? Simple stuff. Now, as far as whether or not that's going to work for Guillermo Rigondeau, in my opinion, it's not. But I could see a scenario where, you know, we get some bullshit where he knocks Lomachenko out with, you know, consecutive low blows. He is a Rock Nation fighter, right? We, we've seen that before. And we've seen it from him where he's knocked out people or compromised people with uh, illegal tactics. So that could happen. It could happen where he headbutts Lomachenko and cuts him up and compromises him with low blows and never gets warned for it, right? Corruption, basically, is what I'm saying. Guillermo Rigondeau can win if... Boxing corruption is on his side. And that's 
that's a legitimate concern because, well, corruption was against Lomachenko in this fight, right? People want to talk about him being this top-ranked superstar in the making, and he is, but he's not protected by top rank, right? If he were protected by top rank, he wouldn't be fighting a dirty fighter like Rigon Diao after what had happened to him in this fight where he wasn't protected by top rank, was he? And I've said it, you know, for all of you who are crying about bias and, and this and that, I already proved to you how it is you who's biased. Um, I've said it many times in the past that Orlando Salido punked Lomachenko in this fight. He punked him. He took his confidence from him. Obviously, he used dirty tactics to do that. But still, that is what happened, right? And I've said many times that I don't think that Lomachenko deserves to be on the pound for pound list in part because of this. Unless, you know, your standard is putting Agent Bronner's and Guillermo Rigondeaux on the pound for pound list, then of course he deserves to be, right? Depending on what the standard is. But I've been... I've been a fair, I believe, critic of Lomachenko. And, you know, I didn't cry about this loss. Obviously, corruption is how he lost this fight. But if you ignore all the dirty work, which you shouldn't, but the, the referee did, so you kind of have no choice. As far as, you know, who landed what kind of punches and who dictated, in my eyes, Salido, it was perfectly fair to give the fight to Salido. I thought Salido won this fight, or it wasn't a robbery in that sense. It was a robbery in the sense that, you know, corruption reared its ugly head and won the fight for Salido. Salido was allowed to cheat, basically, right? But he took, he took Lomachenko's confidence away from him. So you, can, you have to be able, you have to be honest with yourself and seeing how these two puzzle pieces fit together, Lomachenko and Rigondeau, you have to consider this a legitimate concern for Lomachenko going up against Rigondeau. However, in my opinion, it was in this same fight that this very inexperienced fighter in Lomachenko who went from having, what, like eight, six-round fights to the first 12-round fight ever. I mean, no one seems to be talking about that, like how, how impressive that was in, in and of itself, where he only had like eight, six-rounders, I believe, and then went straight into a 12-round championship fight, title fight, right? But it was a learning experience because right even in that very fight, I think in the 11th and in the championship rounds, Lomachenko found his confidence again, right? And he went to work and he even hurt Salido. And I think he very much matured in this very fight and hasn't looked back since, has looked spectacular ever since, right? And Salido was the bigger guy, whereas now he's going to be the bigger guy against Rigon Diao and all that other stuff. So even though you have to consider it a, a possibility because of, again, how the puzzle pieces fit in this case, if I'm making a judgment call here and I'm making a prediction, um, I think Rigon Diao will try dirty stuff, but I don't think it's going to work. But I wouldn't be surprised if, you know, we got some bullshit like this fight or... At least two of three of Rigondeau's fights and, you know, fights that we've been seeing on, on when Rock Nation fighters are, are involved. So that's my video. Thank you for watching. I'm out.